NLP and indeed parliamentarians for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, the role of parliamentarians. Matt Robson was going to speak. He's the former Minister for Disarmament and Arms Control of New Zealand. New Zealand, I think, is the only country which has a cabinet ministerial position on disarmament and arms control. Um, now he's no longer a parliamentarian, but he's our coordinator for the Asia, uh, Southeast Asia and the Pacific region. Um, PNND, our network of parliamentarians, uh, is working closely with Abolition 2000 because for legislators, whether they're mayors or parliamentarians, to be effective, they need to have cooperation, engagement, and a push uh, from civil society. So uh, that's why our network of parliamentarians is not only open to any parliamentarian who wants to join and is interested in nuclear disarmament, but it's also an open network. Our members are up online, people can see them, so civil society can contact them, ask them to support various initiatives uh, in, in terms of to ensure that cooperation and engagement. Um, so uh, we're a network of about uh, 700 parliamentarians around the world. I'm just going to pull up the web page there in case you haven't seen it um, and you can see a little bit of what we're doing. Our legislators, our parliamentarians, come from a range of political parties, uh, from the left, from Greens, from Liberals, from Moderates, from Social Democrats, uh, from Conservatives. It's pretty much across the board. Not every political party in the world, but many of the political parties. Um, we, as I said, we're an open entry network for parliamentarians. So a parliamentarian can join PNND and become engaged uh, without having to sign on to a particular initiative or policy. So the initiatives that we publicize on our webpage and that we assist parliamentarians with, none of them are compulsory for all of our members to support. They can support them if they want to or not. Um, and that way we provide a forum for, for engagement between parliamentarians as well. And we've had, for example, some quite conservative parliamentarians join and then their ideas and their approach has shifted as a result of being involved in the network and become much more progressive. Um, so uh, that's the approach that we take. We generally don't adopt policy statements, but what we do do is that we provide a range of issues and action ideas for parliamentarians. So for example, the Parliamentary Action for a Nuclear Weapons Free World um, is something which we put together in cooperation with the Interparliamentary Union, which is the uh, International Organization of Parliaments. 178 parliaments are members of the Interparliamentary Union. Uh, so they're very big. They are assemblies. They have about 700 parliamentarians at two assemblies every year, as well as a third parliamentary event at the United Nations. A huge budget because parliaments are members of them. We are like their uh, section on nuclear disarmament. So we come in and we can do events at the Interparliamentary Union assemblies. We can guide their discussion on nuclear disarmament initiatives. We can help them adopt resolutions. Uh, which are then influential in member parliaments around the world. And as I mentioned, uh, the IPU, it's because the parliaments are members, then it's cross-party also. Uh, and that work has enabled us, even though we're very small and have very little money, it's given us a lot of influence amongst parliamentarians around the world by being so much engaged with the Interparliamentary Union. Um, also, we're very engaged with other regional bodies like the uh, Parliamentary Assembly for the OSCE, Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is 56 parliaments and includes uh, four of the nuclear armed states, uh, Russia, France, the UK and the United States. Uh, so here is a Parliamentary Assembly where you can engagement on nuclear risk reduction measures, for example, and we've got parliamentarians from the, some of the key nuclear armed countries there to engage in the dialogue uh, and then that can be influential. Uh, so in consultation with those two parliamentary assemblies, we brought together this parliamentary action plan. Um, this is the summary of it. Uh, it gives a little bit of a description of it. And then there's 14 different action areas. The actual plan itself is like uh, 20 pages long and has lots of examples of what parliamentarians can do. But this is a guide of sort of what our network of parliamentarians are working on. So the range of things, as you see. Um, I'll just pick up a couple of them. One, of course, is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. 
Uh, and that's been something that particularly our parliamentarians and non-nuclear countries have been engaged in. But not so much the parliamentarians in the nuclear armed states or the allied states, uh, because they see that their, their government is not likely to join it. And so as a treaty is only um, binding on those states that join in order to move their countries and their governments on, on nuclear risk reduction and disarmament issues, they need to take other steps, other initiatives. Um, and that may be things like de-alerting, uh, changing the role of nuclear weapons in security doctrines, trying to phase out the reliance on nuclear deterrence and looking at common security instead of that. Uh, no first use, stockpile reduction, uh, cutting the nuclear weapons budgets. These are actions that can be taken by the legislators in some of the nuclear armed and allied states. They're not in competition with each other. What we show is these actions are, it's necessary to take a range of actions to deal with this issue. Um, and then some of those are, the actions can be like resolutions in Parliament, debates in Parliament, uh, public events like showing uh, movies or having hearings, uh, adopting resolutions and doing joint letters or appeals with other parliamentarians. Uh, and we've already, um, Jackie's already mentioned one that we did, the Basel Appeal, which was parliamentarians, mayors and civil society leaders. So some cooperation through there. Um, I think that's probably enough for me to mention, except I will just add one more thing. Um, we've been quite active on the Korea peace process as that is uh, an opportunity to change the situation. Uh, we have an opening for peace and denuclearization in Northeast Asia that we haven't seen for a long time. And so our members have been very active on this. Uh, and we are guided very much from our South Korean members because they understand uh, what's required to build a sustainable, secure and lasting peace with their neighbours, with DPRK. Um, and right at this moment, uh, the president of uh, South Korea is in Washington, D.C., uh, to have a summit with uh, President Trump to try and get the peace process back on, on track. Um, and so we've got... Uh, in Korea, we're very involved in a number of activities. Uh, one of those was to a joint uh, event with civil society, the Pyeongchang Global Peace Forum. Uh, we've, doing, we've done a number of sessions within the National Assembly uh, in South Korea, cross party. Uh, we've been participating in the uh, United States Korea Peace Network uh, in terms of like bringing cooperation between Korean uh, civil society organizations, parliamentarians, and U.S. activists to put sort of pressure on the United States to take a proper approach to the uh, to the situation. And we'll be having our next PNND assembly. Most likely, we're just finalizing the details in Korea, hosted by the uh, president or the chair of the National Assembly there. Um, so that's, I think, enough for the moment on PND. You can always find more on the website where you'll see a range of actions uh, that we're taking, that uh, PND members are taking on these issues. Uh, and as I said, the key thing for us is to build the cooperation between parliamentarians, mayors, and civil society, because that way we're going to be much more effective.